All right, there's a big problem with the pro-life movement, and it's a whole lot worse than that song. In fact, what I'm talking about has nothing to do with abortion. The issue is they are not pro-life enough, which I will elaborate on more in a bit. The topic of abortion is one of the most contentious subjects in American politics, and some pretty extreme violence has taken place over it. Since 1977, there have been 8 murders, 17 attempted murders, 42 bombings, and 186 arsons committed against abortion clinics and doctors. This guy was shot in 1993 by anti-abortion extremists and lived to tell the tale until, well... <laughs> to recap... He survived two extreme financial crashes before getting gunned down at church and had people celebrate his death. That's the American dream, baby. In all seriousness, anti-abortion violence has caused some serious mayhem and frightened a lot of people. But one side is not always a lone perpetrator. On the other end of the spectrum, we also have violence against pro-life supporters. If someone was raped and she gave birth and she decided to kill her three-year-old child. She decided to kill... Three-year-old That wind up kills me every time. This also happened. But don't worry, he bounced right up. It's no secret who the pro-life party is. It's unmistakably a core tenet for Republicans, as evidenced by what their politicians say, and plenty of polls that have Republicans anywhere from 68 to 75 percent in favor. This position is also undoubtedly fueled by many Christian denominations. Organizing politically based on the common value of protecting life is admirable, whether you're Christian or not, but there is so much more life worth protecting besides the unborn that is completely ignored or outright opposed by elected Republicans. This video is meant to make it abundantly clear that voters need to hold their supposedly pro-life Republican officials to a much higher standard, which brings us to our first topic, war. That's right, war. The thing that's just about as polar opposite of pro-life as you can get. But it's certainly been propagated by the pro-life party. At this point, everyone knows the invasion of Iraq was based on complete bull****. And the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh <laughs> and it was started by a supposedly pro-life president. I'm, 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 I was a pro-life president. Here's a fetus. There are many similar examples over recent decades, but I will focus primarily on one ongoing conflict in particular, the cluster in Yemen. To summarize all too succinctly, in 2014, Houthi rebels backed by Iran seize control of Yemen's capital city. Yemen's president resigns. A coalition of states led by Saudi Arabia embargo Yemen and bomb Houthi-controlled areas to high hell with aid from the U.S. Yemen's president unresigns. Peace negotiations falter, and a brutal ongoing conflict between the Saudi coalition and Houthi rebels continues, with guest appearances from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and U.S. airstrikes. Here's a quick clip of what it looks like on the ground. One might ask themselves, well, to what actual extent is the U.S. involved, and how does it involve the pro-life party? For starters, the U.S. used to refuel Saudi planes mid-air. The U.S. also sells loads of weapons to them. 
our former internationally renowned, thick-skinned, strong-nosed commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, is very proud of all the weapon deals he helped facilitate. But if you look in terms of dollars, $3 billion, $533 million, $525 million, that's peanuts for you. Should have increased it. And what it does is it really means uh, many, many jobs. We're talking about over 40,000 jobs. You're talking about jobs. What I'm doing here, we've created an incredible economy. I want Boeing and I want Lockheed and I want Raytheon to take those orders and to hire lots of people to make that incredible equipment. Well, you understand. You know, yeah, no, I, I get it, but it, it's, it's, it's complicated stuff. And, you know, you're looking at jobs here at home and, and a lot of money for American companies versus um, what certainly seems is, is, is pretty atrocious. Now, we don't I, know everything, I, but we don't know. I mean, these are these are uh, the let's decisions hope, that you face as president. You know, something is incredibly messed up when even Fox News refers to defense spending as atrocious. And they're correct. Too many of these weapons are used to massacre civilians, and U.S. support of the Saudi-led coalition helps perpetuate horrific death and destruction. Let's also not pretend that much of this money is somehow a great boon to your typical American worker. Much of it is going to line the pockets of the already obscenely rich defense contractor executives, shareholders, and pay the salaries of highly skilled engineers who would find other work in a heartbeat if these deals didn't go through. Look, I'm all for American manufacturing jobs, but not at the expense of killing huge numbers of innocent people. Anyways, let's concentrate for a moment on just what violent travesties have been carried out. From March 2015 to September 2017, the coalition bombed 356 farms, 174 markets, and 61 food storage facilities, in addition to also destroying dams and hospitals. On March 15, 2016, U.S. supplied bombs killed at least 97 civilians, including 25 children, during a double strike on a market in the city of Mastaba that is thought to have also killed 10 Houthi militants. One witness claimed the locals were opposed to the Houthi presence, but had no power to prevent it. And I mean, it's got a point. They have guns. If you're ever bored, head on over to Snap Maps and just go poking and prodding around Yemen for all kinds of fun surprises. You'll find plenty of people strapped up with AKs. There also was the market bombing in Sada, which killed 51 people, including 40, yes, 40 children. A nearby hospital director described the scene in his hospital as, instead of bodies arriving at the morgue, it was a mangled mess of severed limbs and body parts. On August 15th, 2016, a Doctors Without Borders hospital was hit with an airstrike, killing 11 and injuring 19. In January of 2022, a laser-guided missile obliterated a prison in northwestern Yemen, killing at least 80 and injuring over 200. The UN described the strike as, quote, the worst civilian casualty incident in the last three years in Yemen. This little girl was orphaned after her entire family was killed in their home from an airstrike. How do we know for sure that these weapons are manufactured by the U.S.? Well, when these go boom... They leave behind little thank you cards from Raytheon, or, I mean, misfortunate fragmentation. That looks like this. I could go on for hours discussing the documented cases of mass civilian murder. But, these civilian killings are not even the worst of it. Many more multiples of people in and around war zones die from obliterated infrastructure, including roads, buildings, and farms, which destabilizes access to work and basic necessities like food or clean drinking water. A staggering 5 million people are at risk for famine, including hundreds of thousands of children. Nima el Bagir braved serious risk and journeyed straight into the heart of Yemen to document just how senseless and perverse this conflict has been on the millions of innocent lives caught in the crossfire. The sight of gaunt, emaciated children is beyond heartbreaking. What enables such insidious starvation? The coalition's air and naval blockade around the country, which has severely hindered food, fuel, and medicine from entering large swaths of territory since 2015, in addition to intercepting arms shipments from Iran destined for rebels. 
Prior to 2015, Yemen relied on imports to account for 80 to 90% of its food. As you can see, there is a stark contrast in what ports look like before and after the blockade was initiated. Do pro-life members of Congress know what these weapons are being used for? Yes. Unless they live under a rock out of fear for Jewish space lasers or because they didn't graduate high school. In all seriousness, this issue has been covered enough in the media that it's impossible for them to not know. Additionally, all domestic weapon sales to foreign countries require approval from the State Department, and Section 36 of the U.S. Arms Export Control Act requires congressional notification for sales of $14 million or higher, depending on the country it's being sold to and what product is being sold. I'm not sure if you know, but weapon sales are typically way higher than $14 million. In terms of dollars, $3 billion, $533 million, $525 million, $13 billion, $3.8 billion, $1.2 billion, $1.4 billion. Pro-life members of Congress know what is happening, they just don't care, which exemplifies that they aren't truly pro-life, they are just anti-abortion. This painfully obvious logical discontinuity extends to the United States healthcare system as well. I fully acknowledge many people's eyes glaze over the second some four-eyed goober starts talking about healthcare. But this is incredibly important stuff. We're talking about people's lives here. There are simply some public goods that should not operate based on profit motives, and healthcare should be one of them. It needs to be viewed the same way fire departments and public K-12 education are. A vital service everyone needs, free at the point of service. Even if someone disagrees with that perspective, there is one thing that's absolutely irrefutable. The fact that Medicare for All saves money over private insurance because its prices are not based on turning as large a profit as possible. We have gigantic, many multi-billion dollar publicly traded health insurers. Their business model is taking your money in exchange for making billing more difficult and adding no actual value as they insert themselves between you and your doctor as a middleman. Their exorbitant prices are the reason 28 million Americans are uninsured right now. That's 28 million people at risk for dying from preventable conditions that are allowed to progress farther than they would if these people had proper access to affordable care. <laughs>
The Supreme Court, however, struck one provision down by ruling states could not be forced to expand, so expansion became an option that should have been a no-brainer. What elected representative would not want their constituents to have expanded access to health care while the federal government fields 90% of the costs? Well, it turns out, plenty of states. The fragmented democracy author found that 8 of 11 states with the highest percentage of black population in the whole country did not expand Medicaid. I will let you be the judge of why that might be. Yo, Kanye, what do you think? George Bush doesn't care about black people. I also should note that last year, Louisiana, who has the second highest percentage of black population, did finally expand Medicaid and is no longer a part of those original eight states. Better late than never. You cannot claim to be pro-life while simultaneously denying health coverage to millions of poor Americans that you only have to pay 10% of the costs for. Therefore, the pro-life movement needs to evolve from a single-issue position, anti-abortion, to an umbrella that covers other issues that perfectly align with their current goals. Pro-life supporters need to hold their elected officials accountable to actually be pro-life and not just govern under the guise of it. After viewing seemingly infinite unjust pain, suffering, death, and devastation while researching for this video, I could not help but think about this picture and the perspective it provides. Tucked away in that celestial beam of light is the Earth, a mere 3.7 billion miles away from the Voyager 1 spacecraft that captured this image, one of the last pictures it would ever take. This ego death inducing photograph was coined the pale blue dot by Carl Sagan, who had a lot to say about it. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of. Every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there, on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that, in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. If you're gonna be pro-life, you might as well go all the way. If you made it this far, you must like me enough to subscribe, so go ahead and hit that button right now. You also must really care about these issues, so head on down to the description and use my email templates to contact your representatives in Congress. Individually, we are weak, but collectively, we actually have a chance to make an impact.